Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hi there and welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. This is episode number 141. And we have a really interesting one here for you today, one that may actually challenge your existing thoughts on trading models. I know that uh, this episode has certainly made me think about it from a different angle, so I hope you enjoy this as much as I have. Now, our guest for this episode is Kevin Saunders from Triblet Capital. Kevin is a specialist in electronic trading across many international exchanges, co-founding Non-Correlated Capital in 2009, which later became a licensed CTA with more than 40 mil under management. Kevin has won a bunch of awards for his trading and academic achievements, and he also developed a program here in Australia called The Joey Experiment, which we're going to talk a little bit about as well. In our chat today, you'll discover why traders must disentangle themselves from the requirement that a model must work and produce money. (laughs) Say what? And the alternative approach that uses a chart more predictable than the underlying market. You'll also hear why building a mathematical model is like creating a unicorn that doesn't represent reality. And also why traders need to stop thinking about building a model as a solution and how to think about it instead. Plus, we're going to go through much more as well. So does that sound interesting? Well, let's get started and jump over now to my chat with Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for joining us today. It's uh, it's really great to have you here on the show. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, how about we just start firstly with a little bit of background so people can uh, get to know you a little bit better. So do you want to just give us um, a bit of info about yourself and how you actually got started in the markets? Yeah, sure. Uh I guess I'm one of those kinds of traders who never had a conventional pathway through the financial world. Uh, originally, I was a musician for about 10 years. I went to the conservatorium and did jazz guitar and was interested in, in music primarily. But uh, there was something that happened when I was in my late 20s where I received a inheritance from my grandmother. And I wanted to invest that wisely. And despite my best intentions, I think I chose the wrong people to take advice from. I paid for a very expensive course. I went off and uh, uh, trained under one of these trading educators. And uh, it was just 1998 and I started trading uh, Australian shares. Went, went really well, obviously, uh, leading up to the dot-com crash in 2000, I was quite pleased with myself, thinking that I had found some sort of a, an answer. Um, I, I was the smartest investor alive. And then, uh, of course, uh, it all came to a crash and halt in 2000. I, I lost a great deal of, of the capital that I was given from my grandmother, and it was a real wake-up call. Uh, interestingly though, um, it did put a bee in my bonnet and it became my mission in life to go ahead and, and, uh, and right the wrongs. So for many years after that, I, I, I studied and learned, uh, with much more, a much more serious eye to what was good information and what was bad information. Uh, I guess just as an, as an aside here, even though I felt awful, about the uh, the losses in 2000, and there was a shame associated with uh, you know losing that that gift. Uh, ironically, it was a gift in another way, in such a way that it, it gave me direction, it gave me focus, and it gave me a career. So that was a very uh, interesting thing. How often uh, you know what appears to be a, a terrible calamitous event can can actually turn around and and uh, have a beneficial effect later. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners would be able to relate to that. Anyway, from there, I I, I did do a, a lot of training in my own time. I was also skilled in um, producing media products, so I, I got involved with other trader trainers, 
uh, producing their uh, the training materials. And uh, finally, in 2006, I got a job in a proprietary trading house, trading um, Euro bonds and Euro stocks futures. Did that for about a year. Uh, there were a lot of promises of, of ever greater funding, but uh, <laughs> at the end of all of that, <laughs> There was, uh, th- th- that never eventuated. And I'm sure there's some people out there that can relate to that one as well. Uh, that being said, um, I did make some connections. And, uh, as a result, I got involved with a, a colleague of mine that we decided that we would, uh, start building a track record end of 2007, uh, utilizing a options volatility strategy that we developed. And at the same time, I was involved as a general manager of a a trader training organization uh, in 2008, which was an interesting year to start in that (laughs) industry. Um, Now, as part of that, uh, I started my first exploration into systematic trading, and I built a a, using an old piece of software, which I think is still available now, um, based on the principles that we used in the Turtle uh, trading style, which are Dennis and so forth. Uh, and it, it was called the spy gap filler using the spy uh, index futures in Australia. So the, the uh, equivalent to the E mini 500 futures in America and Australia. Uh, we built a trading strategy there using a, a fairly simple mes- method of uh, filling gaps on open because obviously the market would be closed for a certain period of time. Um, and when it would open, if there was movement while the, the market was closed, it would gap and often the gap was being filled. It was a very simple idea. And fortunately, uh, the volatility and the type of market it was at the time, we did very well. We made about 80% that year trading this strategy, ironically trading long a lot of the time into the falling market because the market would gap far too far and open and it retrace. So uh, near the end of that year, the, the system started to fail. And I suppose I looked back on my 2000 experience and said, okay, well, this is another sign that I should be pulling the pin. So I I, I guess that was my first uh, realization that systems are not perennial. They're not everlasting. You actually have to uh, monitor them carefully and know when to uh, to pull them aside. Meanwhile, the strategy that we were uh, incubating, if you like, was going very well in the options market, and that was a process that was not systematic at all. And as a result of of uh, ongoing success in that, uh, by about 2012, we uh, registered as um, commodity trading advisors in America because it was easier for us to to market what we were doing in America than to. Uh, jump the regulatory hurdles in Australia, and uh, <clears throat> we got uh, registered at the NFA. By this stage, we had about, uh, what was it, 2000, about th- uh, three, three and a half years of, of track record, which was very good, and we went off to America and New York and Chicago trying to raise money for this strategy, um, which we were successful. We managed to raise about uh, 50 million in Australian dollars uh, in managed accounts uh, to to trade this strategy. And by 2013, I was managing about 96 different trading accounts at any given moment. And it's funny, again, something that your listeners might relate to, but it's a case of be careful what you wish for. Because when you're building up to that kind of thing, you, you, you have a very clear goal in mind. And But when you get there, sometimes it's not of the shape and form you had first imagined. And as a result, uh, by the time I got to 2013, in 2013, I, um, I was very much pulling my hair out. I think um, I'd started to realize that the stress of managing that many individual accounts um, – managing that kind of money and having many, many late nights coupled with young children, uh, <laughs> I was – I was. <laughs> How did you do that? Oh, my goodness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I, I can tell you there were times where you would uh, be in, up in the middle of the night with a, 
a toddler with a 40 degree fever on the left and a, a crashing oil futures market on the right. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so it was a, it was most definitely a trial by fire, yeah. and I, I certainly um, began to realise that at the point at which you felt that you had achieved something, we had our own firm, we were we had money under management, we had the lights on. Uh, I, I couldn't keep this up; it was just too much. So um, by the end of 2013, I I, I uh, sort of deprioritised, if you like. Uh, that aspect, I still am associated with the firm, but I decided I would start Tribal Capital and go back. I was I kept thinking back to the uh, 2008 experience and the uh, and the spy gap filler and how easy in comparison uh, executing that system was. And I, I and I've all along been interested in in this systematic process from the viewpoint that well. You know, once you've done what you've needed to do in preparation, you really have to let it do what it's going to do, and you can't really get overly involved, at least not at the exit point of execution. So that appealed to me. I teamed up with a uh, with a co- another colleague that I developed a relationship with over the previous years. And we started to work on what has now become GEO, the Global Equity Opportunities um, Meme Reversion System. And since 2013, we've been trading a multi-market Meme Reversion strategy that covers about 15 stock markets around the world, um, three major regions, US, uh, Europe and Australia and Asia. And uh, so far, we've been... Well, we were beating the benchmark for many years, but uh, right now we're about neck and neck because the <laughs> the index over the last year has just been uh, unrealistic, to say the least. Um, nonetheless, uh, that presses on. We're looking for institutional interest in that particular one, and we're um, currently in the process of um, deploying a new strategy in the foreign exchange markets. Hmm. So uh, that takes us up to present. Wow. Okay. So there's, a, there's, it's quite a story there. When I was doing some research on you the other day, I found out something called the Joe's experiment or the incubating Joe's experiment, which I thought was quite interesting. Can you um, share a little bit about how, what that experiment was and and uh, perhaps how it came about? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So um, the strategy that we used for the CTA uh, was an option strategy. Uh, I love options. I think they're very, very powerful investment tools. Um, it's so ultimately flexible and um, you can really design your risk reward profile very, uh, very precisely with those instruments. Um, unfortunately, in Australia and my time zone, our options market is leaves something to be desired. And so really, um, this is just a caveat before we talk about the Joes. It's important to recognise that people in this region, um, you really have to be considering um, late nights to access really lively and and, uh, and and worthwhile options markets to trade. However, that being said, I've been doing that for some years, and I thought, well, um, we could pass on some of the skills and. It was interesting because I remember, you know, as you sort of developing as a trader, you hear all of the trader folklore. And of course, many of your listeners will have heard of the turtles experiment with Richard Dennison yeah. and uh, his colleague and, and, and how successful it was. Uh, the bet being um, whether they could trade, they train traders like they were breeding turtles in the Singapore zoo. Right, and so uh, really, it was just a harking back to that uh, early '80s experiment uh, with an Australian um, context, with the Joey's being a baby kangaroo. Yep. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyhow, uh, the, it was a four four month process um, of daily one hour um, web meetings. We had a group of about 12 people who were involved, including a uh, journalist from the Australian Financial Review. And 
uh, we went from the very beginnings of uh, and basics of, of, of how options work through to quite advanced spread strategies and so forth. Um, the view from, from my point of view was um, I'm just going to try my best to be as broad. I have lots of time. I have lots of uh, space to to develop um, from the very simplest levels to as complex as I could manage. Um, you know, and and so it was really going to be a, a quite free form. I mean, how can you write out a course that comprises of five one-hour uh, lectures, if you like, a week for four months? Um, so <laughs> I, there was a great deal of uh, of just basically winging it. But I was very surprised that you know, once we built all the interactive tools and, and how we could to and fro, it, it had brought on a life of its own. And certainly um, uh, we, we discovered some interesting things. One of the things that we discovered that I thought was quite interesting is I, I did what we called the, uh, the daily uh, prediction exercise where everybody in the group would make a prediction whether the S&P 500 would be up or down the next day and we track hit rate on that question uh, going over four months. And it was quite interesting to see that 11 out of 12 uh, joeys, typically around 30 to 40% uh, successful in picking the next day direction. <laughs> there <Wow>. was, that's <laughs> there was, <laughs> that's a, 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 that was a very illuminating, um, not entirely unexpected result. Now, the, there was one person and perhaps a person you would never have supposed would be the one who would do it if you tried to, uh, to, to judge a person by perhaps, um, you know, is he an engineer, is he a rocket scientist, is he a... a you know, is he a what you would class as a as a as a nerd or a computer scientist? Is he someone you think, "Whoa, that guy's got a lot of brains"? Um, uh, typically, people who are highly intelligent were scoring the lowest. Uh, this 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 chap was a real salt, salt of the earth type, um, lovely man in his almost pushing seventy. And he was up around 70%. Wow. Um, um, so I guess another bit of insight I got from that was, well, it's not something to do with intelligence or, or how much maths you know or, 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 or how many tertiary degrees you have. There's something ephemeral in this. There's something that's not uh, – that you cannot capture as being – um, a, a repeatable or necessarily programmable um, feature of success in the markets. Um, if you follow that through or that line of logic through, you would say, well, um, surely if this guy is getting 70% success rate, let's sit him down and try and write code yeah. or program a system that, that, uh, that determines uh, that, that accurately reflects how he chooses direction in the market the next day. Because yeah. let's face it, uh, all you really need is a system that's that can predict whether the market's going to be up or down the next day. You buy on open and you sell on close, and if you can get 70% success rates, well, uh, you're away. It's really that simple. Um, but uh, uh, I guess what I was... I guess what we've learned is is that for the people who are using a discretionary method, uh, perhaps there is a little bit of magic still left under the bonnet. Yeah, and what about the um the what did you see that the the students struggled with the most in them out of all the trading uh, concepts and things that you taught them? Um, always, from my experience, it was always a question of. Um, uh, how procedural they were, uh, how um, strict they were with their daily procedures. Um, the, it's always consistency, no matter what. 
that kills traders, um, in my experience, in my opinion, because it's always the guys that, and this is why you keep, you, you always hear these stories of people who were successful in, in the past and you, and you find out, oh, they also wanted to be sportsmen. They wanted to be, they, they understood the importance of training, of, of, of consistency, of being serious about uh, their daily procedures. Um, and, and, and they, they never let up. They, they're, and this is, you know, uh, there was a lot of information and there was a lot of support, uh, behind the information to allow for the traders to revise and to revisit what was, what was presented. Every single, um, every single hour session was recorded. I still have all the recording and, uh, you know, did the, did the majority of people revisit those recordings and build upon what they already knew and, and reinforce the learning. I would say uh, 80% of them uh, fell, fell short on that. And it was really the 20% of them that, uh, I mean, I still see one of the Joeys even today because we have, um, we were using a, a Dropbox. So uh, I could still see him going into his folder today, uh, three years later, making changes to the spreadsheets we built and, and, so he's still at it, you know, and, and it's really about that. It's about – it's a lot of people, uh, it would seem, are collectors of information but not appliers of, of the knowledge. Yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. Yeah. Okay, so before we move on to building strategies, I just want to know, so out of that experiment, how do you view it? Do you think it was successful? You know, are those students going on to be being traders or what's your overall opinion on the success of that program? Um, I, I don't think many of them are uh, moving on to being traders. I know that several of them contacted me and said that they have been doing well, but they've sort of uh, dropped away from regular communication, so I, I really haven't kept track of that. Um, I think if I were to do something like that again, I think the process by which we choose candidates would have to be looked at a lot more closely. I think that was one of the issues. Um, <clears throat> And also, to be fair, like I said at the start, the Australian time frame or time zone isn't uh, particularly conducive for the kinds of strategies that I was trading. And, uh, you know, I, to be honest, standing back back from it now, I think to myself, well, even I couldn't keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to walk away from all of that options trading. Um, and, and I was doing very well at it. I mean, we, I, I won a trading competition as a result of, of the style of trading, but it really brings home the, the brings home the, the truth that it's not just having a winning system or a winning method, but it's also is it going to fit into your lifestyle? Is it is this is this the life you want to lead? And that's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, thought that needs to go into that beforehand. Yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So if we move on now to building strategies, I think uh, at the start of this chat, you mentioned that you've got uh, multi-model, multi-market um, strategies now, um, quant-based. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a, an idea about the process you're using to build strategies? Yeah, well, uh, so I guess uh, one of the things that a lot of systematic traders um, encounter is this perennial problem of curfew and producing, I mean, you can get a, a computer to analyze data and, and uh, find a way to traverse <clears throat> the historic data in such a way that it produces a beautiful looking equity curve. Um, and I always, you know, I'm always amazed that, uh, you know, when you when you meet people that are involved with systematic trading, uh, a lot of them are deriving pleasure just from producing uh, great-looking back tests. Um, <laughs> but you can see the joy that this theoretical model um, has given them, because it's kind of like solving a Rubik's cube, right? But 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 does that mean that it's going to work? Uh, in in the front trial, and it's something that 
I've personally struggled with over the years and tried to work out different ways in which to, uh, to, to, to not look at that test as being solving a problem and saying, look how clever I am. I've made a, a great looking equity curve. Uh, but rather as a very initial step in the process. Um, and so something that really isn't worth getting excited about. Okay, so that's a really good place to start. Don't be excited by back tests. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, some yeah. people may disagree with me on these things, but anyway. And I also take, not, I also take, uh, I always keep in the back of my mind um, something that I learned by, through my wife who, is involved with the mathematical modeling of disease. Uh, I mean, building mathematical models uh, obviously aren't, isn't contained within finance. We use mathematical models for everything, but these days, uh, she went and saw, she went to a specialist course in London, uh, involving modeling disease and how to, uh, to, to manage disease outbreaks and, and so forth. And all of the stat guys there uh, in this room, they all had little unicorns on the tops of their computers. Now, what's what's this unicorn business? Right? But but really, what they're trying to say here is is that building a model is really just like creating a unicorn. It's a fictitious. Um, creation. It's nothing, it doesn't really represent reality per se. It's a beautiful model, but it's not reality. And one of the best quotes I've ever heard about this comes from one of these disease modelers. And if you wouldn't mind, I'll read it. Yeah, it goes, sure. uh, mathematical models are never perfect. In fact, they're always wrong. Because no model can mimic the complexities of real life. However, models are invaluable tools for disentangling the relative importance and behavior of a small number of variables in a reproducible and controlled manner. So, what I mean, that's a lot to absorb in one sentence. I, I understand that. However, if you listen to it over and over again, it starts to really fall into place. Um, we're building these models not so that we have certainty about life. We're building these models such that we can track a small number of variables and do so in a reproducible and controlled manner. So all that we really want to do from building a model, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, enable us to have a small dashboard and to be able to read that dashboard. So if you take an, an analogy of a, of a 747, the pilot, when he's flying on instruments only, so that's a situation where he can't see out the window at all, the only thing that tells him that he's straight and level are the instrumentation. And if the instrumentation tells you uh, uh, <laughs> you're plunging into a mountain, you better do something. Yeah. You better do something quick, right? So really um, I started to think about it in those terms. I stopped thinking about building a model as a, as a solution to a problem rather a model as a tool by which we um, build a instrumentation or dashboard from which we can monitor certain features of the market in real time and control our overall position. And I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting perspective to think of it, that the model is really just telling you um – a relationship between variables rather than a solution, yeah. Exactly. Mm. So you, you disentangle yourself from this requirement that your model must work and produce money. Rather, you see the model as a way to inform you that it's doing what you want it to do or it's not doing what you want it to do. And that's it. There's no, if it's not doing what you want it to do, then you've got to switch that thing off and wait until it starts doing what you want it to do. 
So for me, uh, the process is try and introduce, introduce a tool that allows the creation of models to be highly efficient, then to create an overlay which allows um, you to monitor the, monitor the models in that same sort of dashboard format, and then finally on-off switches that bring them onto the live market and off again. And, and that's that's the essential process. Now, I mean, every little step that's involved in producing a model, uh, testing whether it's worth even tracking going forward, um, out of sample testing, front trialing, all of that, all of those steps can be done in a myriad of ways. I, I mean, I, I use a, a machine learner to come up with the core trading ideas, which is essentially just reaching into a basket of Lego pieces and putting together uh, various combinations and testing it on on data to see if it works. Um, I have a couple of out-of-sample tests that I would like to do on the models produced, and then I put it into a front trial environment where it will stay for whatever period of time is required for me to get my um, standard error down to as little as I can. Uh, and we can talk about standard error if, if you want, but basically enough trades such that what we're reading off that uh, front trial is sufficient to start relying upon the data. Yeah. And then once that's done, um, start bringing it into a live environment through which it's always being monitored and if it starts to misbehave, it goes back into the sin bin, so to speak, continually trading, but um, not with real money, uh, until it starts going back on track. Yeah. So I think um, uh, what I'm I think what I'm hearing here, but correct me if I'm wrong, is that you don't necessarily care what the actual logic of the model is, but um, more it's more important to prove that it, it's giving you the right kind of signals and that it's robust and so therefore the the out of sample testing and all those other techniques that you're using are more important than the underlying logic of the model is that is that yes I would have to say that's right yeah. however um, I like to see I like to have a, a qualitative view to the behavior of the model so um, so let's say you, you you disentangle yourself from the desire to have a model that trades over 10 years and produces a beautiful bottom left to top right 45 degree equity curve, right? So you just say, that's it. I'm not going to ever produce one of those again. Mm. What I'm going to produce is a equity curve that looks, you know, in that context, awful. <laughs> it's got <laughs> periods of extensive downtrends but also has periods of extended uptrends. And so through those periods of extended uptrend, what was it about the market that made that particular algorithm perform so well? Mm -hmm. And if you can roughly categorize that, so well, actually during that period, that particular market was, was trending um, and this seems to be a momentum type entry, um, then I can, I've got a broad idea of where this might perform again in the future in a broad sense. Of course, it doesn't, um, it doesn't remove the need for you to monitor and be very, very careful with your record keeping going forward. And to that end, I, I can't recommend strongly enough that people get good with Excel because as much as it's an old beast, um, <laughs> I find the new the new Power Query tools and the latest Excel to be just amazing and really allows you to bring in data from all sorts of different sources and bring it together. And so if you if you haven't investigated the Power Query tools and the latest Excel, I, I can thoroughly recommend that as a way to to track things going forward. It's what I what I do every day. However, there is a bit of a qualitative view in terms of categorizing why these things are working. But uh, when it comes to the actual logic of the strategy, um, once you've been around the traps long enough and seen 
all of the different technical tools that are available to inform decisions about when you go in and out of the market, you realize that um, it all boils down to the same base level, which is it'll work while it works, and then when it doesn't work, it won't. And so what you're really chasing for is consistency always and then a good control system over the top. So that's why system A trading seems to be the best option. Yeah, just sitting here now thinking about all the possible options you could have for this uh, control strategy that sits over the top of these models. It's, it seems, wow, I can think of so many ideas. It's a, a little bit overwhelming. So how do you, how can people actually get started if they want to start looking at these type of things? Like what kind of okay. process do you recommend? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I Look, I have found uh, back, back when I was supposedly a, an institutional type guy, trading multiple millions in in a cta type um, environment i would look at retail forex and think it was just you know a, a bit of a joke to be honest but i think i was I, I think i accept now i was a bit of a bit of a snob about that to be honest um i'm a complete mt4 convert um and the reason why is you really do need to have an environment in which you can trade with real money. I mean, you simply can't take the final leap unless you, you're trading something. Now, MT4 allows you to trade very, very small, 10 cents a pip. So you can, you can try multiple methods with real execution uh, without, you know, running out of, of capital mm. if you're careful. So that's one reason. Another reason is, I've tried uh, systematic trading on many platforms, many different platforms, and a lot of them are very uh, memory-hungry beasts that over time they slow down, grind uh, VPSs to halts and so forth. But uh, MT4, it may seem like a it's, – it's like a rough diamond. It just – it keeps going. It never fails. It never chews up more memory than it starts with. It doesn't slow down. VP. I have had MT4s running uh, with 80 strategies, 90. St- you can get 99 charts on an on MT4, and you can run up to 32 MT4s instances on one machine. Um, so in theory, you could have thousands of strategies. I've I've had up to 250 strategies on one VPS that's not heavily loaded up for memory or power for, per se, running for six months without failure. <laughs> <Wow>. um, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a convert. I'm, I've got the MT4 robes on right now. You know, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm an MT4, you know, I, I go to the Church of MT4 weekly. <laughs> so, I, you know, as a as a as a prototyper, as a way of testing, it's fantastic. As a way of deploying for real money, it's fantastic. And uh, of course, the foreign exchange market is fantastic for systematic strategies because it's continuous. You don't have to deal with gaps so much apart from weekends. Um, you have to be careful with the rollover times where the spreads get wide. But other than that, I think it's a it's a fantastic testing ground, um, and it's really scalable. I mean, if you ever got to a point where you needed to trade very large sums of money, uh, there are ways in which you can take NT4 through fixed connections into proper institutional liquidity if you, if you needed to. So it really is a pathway that gives you all of those options, as well as the supporting technology, um, the kinds of machine learning um, applications out there for building strategies quickly, um, there's a plethora of them now. I, I don't need to promote any individual one because there are so many that are good. Um, I, I think it's very important, of course, to to if you're not a coder yourself, uh, to um, hook up with somebody who can do a bit of coding because uh, you know a lot of these machine learning um, strategy generators are um, produce code that perhaps isn't entirely robust. Mm. Um, so what we, what we do at Tribalit is, um, generate code and then rewrite some of the code to give it more executional r- robustness. So instead of retrying a, a strategy 
uh, entry three times, it retries it 20 times, to, you know, make sure that the thing gets filled. Those kinds of little tweaks. So that might be useful, but not necessarily. And just get very, very good at Excel. I mean, Excel and MT4 communicate beautifully. There are plugins for MT4 that provide a real-time data feed from MT4 into Excel. And so you can have all of your account information streaming into Excel. Mm. It's about all you need and really very low cost, very low barrier of entry. So now in, in the modern era, I think it's, uh, you've, you got more chances than ever, uh, to get it right. Um, just make sure that you, uh, spend a lot of time in front trial. I, I'm bringing on live right now, uh, some strategies that were built in August last year and have been on a demo machine since August last year. We had about 250 of them and, uh, 32 have survived the front, the front trial. Um, and they go into the front, they go into the live environment, but are constantly on a daily basis checked for maintaining their behavioral characteristics. If they don't, if they don't behave themselves, they go back into the sim bin. They don't get thrown away, but, um, if they don't, if they do something that's outside the parameters that these variables that we were talking about earlier, these variables that we can track in a, in a regular way, if they start expect, start uh, diverging from what we would expect, they go straight away back into the symbiont. And so there's a there's a constant workflow of new strategy creation, new um, strategies in the front trial, uh, new strategy deployment live, and strategies misbehaving being put back in the symbiont. And this is just this endless circle going on. Uh, in terms of man- monitoring, Martin, and in terms of managing and lifestyle it's infinitely easier than you know a a discretionary um strategy that you may have to spend hours in front of the screen or you know or you would be woken up in the middle of the night like i used to be um in three in the morning because something had happened and perhaps the oil market was collapsing or the e-minis were going crazy or Mm -hmm. you know these sorts of things so it may seem like an over, uh, overly co- complex picture, but it's all about efficiencies in how you work and your workflow so that all of these steps are only taking 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, and you can condense the entire process down to, uh, well, I mean, I, I think I'm down to about an hour a day spread out at various points through the day managing all the things. That's not bad, so, is it? An hour a day? It's a pretty good day. Yeah, and it's just trading all the time. I mean, we're yeah. around the clock, so uh, definitely the way to go for me. But uh, that being said, I don't want to dis- discourage any of the dis- discretionary uh, magicians out there because uh, they're, they're amazing people. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you um, you talk about MT4 like that because I remember looking at it about 10 years ago and I thought it was horrible. But um, So I'm a bit of an MT4 snob, but maybe I need to readjust my attitude towards that because I'm hearing a lot more people are starting to to use that they're opening up more markets I know in Australia here now you can do stocks and CFDs and some maybe some futures or Look, derivatives of yeah. futures or something so it's kind of expanding and um, it is it yeah. is and I'll tell you it's uh, it's the when you start getting into systematic trading in a heavy way uh, whatever platform is going to execute that code in a robust and reliable manner is your baby and, mm. and I haven't found anything else that does it with such efficiency and with such memory efficiency and you know I mean ultimately it's over the counter products that's true um, however uh, should it get to a point where you want to trade on major exchanges uh, theoretically you can still um, use fix engines to bring that connectivity in later so I still maintain that as a test bed as a prototype or as a up to a certain level of liquidity um, it's it's your final solution so to speak yeah cool all right i'm conscious of our time but we kind of got a little bit over so um just uh, one more question before we start wrapping up now you'll be speaking at the ata conference this year which is um the ataa is the um, australian technical analysis association now uh as i mentioned you'll be speaking there i'm going to be there and i'm really looking forward to hearing what you'll be presenting uh, but can you give us a brief description of what you'll be discussing or what you'll be covering at the conference 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess just to be brief about it, um, many of these speakers talking sort of abstract terms and, and so forth, I thought that for my presentation I would just walk through the uh, process by which we take um, strategy ideas from inception through to trading life. So uh, some, basically a, a practical uh, for systematic trading. Yeah. So you're going to go into more detail around, um, you know, some of the stuff we've just mentioned about uh, trading the model instead of the market and, and those kind of approaches, which I think is uh, quite- Yes. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I really, these days, I really don't want to look at charts at all. Um, I want to look at equity charts, but I don't want to look about at the market charts. I think equity charts are ultimately more predictable than the underlying market. And so that's my thesis uh, and that's what I'm operating. Um, that's what I base my operations over is that we predict via equity rather than by underlying market price. Sounds very interesting. I can't wait to um, to see that presentation. So, looking forward to it. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. Um, if yeah, I'll uh, if people want to um, find out more, I'll have a link on the show notes page so that people can go in and have a look. There's some other great speakers as well on the schedule, so that's going to be great. Very excited to be there with uh, some of the uh, greats. Yeah, that's right. They've lined up some really excellent speakers, so that's going to yeah. be great. All right, now I'd just like to start uh, wrapping up with some quick closing questions. The first one is, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned through trading? Well, I think the biggest lesson was learned for me in 2000 when I lost 60% of my account. I think um, complacency is the killer. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, what is the best trading advice you ever received? Um, you know, I find it very difficult to ask them that question because – um, I've, I've, there's been so much bad advice. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm right in the weeds with this one because yeah. I, no, that's okay. um, I have to really focus. I think it's not so much advice. It's that if you are dedicated, you will gain insight. You have to be patient for it to come. But when it comes, you'll know that you've learned something and it, and it's often best learned yourself. You know, you can be, you, you, as a you know, as a father, you look at your children and you say, "I can warn you about that," but you know, until it actually happens to you, you won't really get it. Yeah, uh, I think there's very, there's very truth there as far as training goes as well. So advice, um, you know, I can't think of anything particularly, but just watch your risk. Don't lose too much money in a, in a chunk because it really knocks you out of the game. Understand risk of ruin; it's really important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite trading books. Um, I like Jack's books, the the Market Wizards. They really, um, and it was such an honour to meet him a few years ago. And I I, I really um, find that uh, anecdotal um, information to be incredibly helpful. Seeing, getting an insight into the minds of these great traders. I think that's great reads, both of those. Um, I think. Um, Van K. Tharp's book, unfortunately named Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom, is a fantastic book in terms of getting the core principles down. It's it's a bit light on gems that will actually work in the market, but I think in many ways you have to find those yourself because what what I remember there was the uh, the famous statement that I could publish my my. Uh, my, my rules in the newspaper, and and uh, and people will still lose money trading it. So, uh, so get to, so foundation stuff. Uh, the bank is absolutely good. Um, I, you know, um, I've heard. I, I'm not a big reader. I, I I really think that the answers lie in processing lots of data, and that's just something. Uh, get good with Excel, <laughs> really. Get good practice with Excel, bringing data in from different sources, playing with it, and uh, learning things inherent. Ask yourself a question, try and solve it with Excel. Mm, okay, that's a good that's a good workplace to start. Yeah, cool. Um, what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? Well, I have a website. Um, you can go to tribalcapital.com.au. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Whenever you want to, uh, you can. I can give you an email address as well, but um, I'd have to be 
yeah, I'd probably want to avoid spam, so I don't know how to do that. But, yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. I think you've got a contact page on your uh, website anyway, so people can just go there and ping you a message if they want to have a chat. Yes. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Kevin. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we finish up? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at the uh, ATAA. I yep. think it's going to be a great event this year. Uh, yep. I feel strangely humbled to be asked, to be honest, because there are such luminaries coming there. So um, uh, fantastic. I can't wait. Yep. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it as well. So I'll catch you there. Uh, but thanks again for spending time with us today. It was, um, it was really nice to chat with you. So thanks again and all the best. It's all the best, Andrew. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.